Good afternoon. As Mr. Bell said, I am, my name is Ty Etchemendi. I'm a junior econ major here at Hillsdale, and I'm also a captain of the track and field team. And it is my honor to introduce our speaker today. Michael Novak is a distinguished visiting professor at Ave Maria University in Florida, a graduate of the Georgian University in Rome and Harvard University. Mr. Novak held the chair in religion and public policy at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington, D.C. for 32 years. He is a recipient of the Templeton Prize and was, on three occasions, U.S. Ambassador under President Ronald Reagan. For this and other service, including his work on the boards of Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty, he was given the highest awards bestowed on foreign citizens by the Czech Republic, Poland, and Slovakia. Mr. Novak is the author of numerous books, including The Universal Hunger for Liberty, The Joy of Sports, The Spirit of Democratic Capitalism, which was translated and published in the Polish Underground in 1984, and most recently, Writing from Left to Right, My Journey from Liberal to Conservative. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Michael Novak. I was happy to hear Matt say that he was a Mets fan. I just want to tell him, <laughs> Dodger fan. Uh, just saying for your alert. Uh, Dodger fan, because every one of my phone numbers has 42 in it. What for? Jackie Robinson. Saw him play several times in Forbes Field in, in Pittsburgh. My talk is called Why We Love Sports. It's not long. If any of you have read George Will's book on baseball, Men at Work, in 1990, which came out some years after my own book, The Joy of Sports, in 1976, you will have noticed a distinct difference between a Protestant and a Catholic approach to sports. <laughs> Both traditions illuminate, both are useful, each in its own way, and in fact, they complement each other. Now, there are several evidences that Will was not only quite aware of the difference, but it took some pains to call attention to it. Part of the difference can be seen in our very two different book titles. Will stressed work men at work, while I stress joy. I first noticed this sort of difference in political ads during the 1960 presidential campaigns of John Kennedy and Richard Nixon. The 1960 election was the first to hold a televised debate between the nominees of the two parties. Public expectations ran very high for some days. <coughs> Political ads for the Nixon campaign during that period highlighted the work habits of Nixon in his preparation. Nixon writing industriously on a legal pad under the lamp late at night, burning the midnight oil. Nixon the hard worker, the serious man. By contrast, the Kennedy campaign released an ad which showed the Kennedy family playing touch football on the beach. Nixon at work, Kennedy at play. Oddly, playing on the beach before so crucial a televised debate suggested needed competences already mastered. No sweat. During the actual debate, Nixon showed a nervous sweat. Kennedy seemed more jaunty and fast on his feet. 
Analogously, Will was eager to show the amount of hard work, sweat, and attention to detail that the highly disciplined Cal Ripken poured into baseball. Now, George and I used to go to the games in Baltimore to see them and saw Cal Ripken play. Uh, George a lot more regularly than I did. The Iron Man started every game for 2,632 straight. Nobody has even come close. Cal's was an inspiring story, and I loved what he achieved. Still, what I would like to stress is the joy and total concentration that Cal put into his play, as if he were working outside of time and space in the light of eternity. Aristotle and the Greek and Christian traditions of contemplation taught me to think of play as an end in itself. True, hard competition may teach many virtues, form human character, and imbue a spirit of discipline and even asceticism. No pain, no gain. But what I remember best about playing football, basketball, and baseball as a young boy, the Holy Trinity, base, football, basketball, and baseball, <laughs> were the moments in which I concentrated so hard on the situation at the moment that I lost all track of time. I felt as if I were living in another domain altogether. When I heard my mother's voice shouting from our back porch that dinner was ready, I often couldn't believe her. It seemed as if no time had passed at all. We just started. To me as a boy, concentrating hard in an intense game was like living in eternity, outside of time. And it filled me with a special kind of joy that even now lifts my spirits. From all this, I later learned to grasp what Aristotle meant and his distinction between the world of ends and the world of means. After this, I came upon the work of Aquinas on contemplation, from the Latin words con plus templum, or temple, being gathered in a temple. And there's part of the religious origins of sports in the old Olympics uh, intended by that. Contemplation such as one experiences in an hour or so of silent prayer in the presence of God, or in the awe and subdued but joyous silence one feels before a sublimely beautiful work of art. In this respect, I especially remember seeing for the first time and many times since, in Florence, Botticelli's The Birth of Venus, and later, Da Vinci's Lady with an Ermine. Before both of these, I've sat for many silent half hours, just taking it in. Contemplation is an intense concentration. Intense may be the wrong word because it's, it's relaxed and it's just absorbing. It's let it all coming in to you. Enjoy every detail of it. And let your eye follow the detail. Contemplation is an intense concentration such that one feels outside oneself. These experiences are quite akin to what I have felt at high moments of play. And I'm going to quote from time to time from the joy of sports. And this is one quote. To be at the right place at the right time, all the truisms leap to mind. To keep cool to handle hundreds of details and call exactly the plays that work, to fight one's way through opposition and to do what one wills to do against odds, against probabilities. These are to practice a very high art, to achieve a few moments of beauty that will for a lifetime delight the memory of those who watched or listened or read. What we mean by legend 
is what we mean by art. The reaching of a form, a perfection, which ordinarily flesh masks, a form eternal in its beauty. It is as though muscle and nerves and spirit and comrades were working together as flawlessly as God once imagined human beings might. In a certain sense, I know, one plays in order to work out, get some exercise, keep in shape, all instrumental purposes aiming at some extrinsic goal, not the joy of the play. But to play is also to treat an activity as a joy in itself. I so love the crack of a bat, that magical sound every spring. We're about to hear it soon. The swish of a net and the wind ringing in my ears as I outrun the last defender, reaching out and getting my fingertips on the ball, hauling it into my chest and sprinting ahead. There's nothing like that. Nothing like that. It's just perfect. And you practice for so long to get the timing down and everything else. But the joy of achieving it under pressure in the game is unbelievably intense and joyous. The Greeks used to refer to such an experience as living in the time of the heroes. That is, performing something so perfect, so excellent, that it carried one outside the humdrum of every day, the endless practices, the learning of the required disciplines. You know, it doesn't matter how many times you practice a play or a pass, or the only one that counts is when the clock is ticking. <laughs> and to hit it then, and right in stride, and right as it was meant to be, is again, so high a pleasure. Um, The taste of excellence in act is Aristotle's very definition of happiness. Happiness is not a feeling. Oh, for goodness sake. I can't believe I did them. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> so in Aristotle's definition of happiness is to perform perfect perfectly, to perform at the top of your game. And there is no happiness like that. But it's not a feeling, it's an achievement. Do you see the difference? The moderns take a different tack, and I think, to their loss. Anyway, in the rest of my education, Joseph Pieper, the German scholars, leisure the basis of culture, Jan Hoisinger, Dutch, homo ludens, man the player, ludens is play. Hugo Rahner, man at play. And James Shaw's two books, easily pleased, a theology of play, contemplation, and festivity. And his other book, Play On, from games to celebrations Both of the, all of those best illuminate moments I have experienced in sport. These books rang true. They made me to write The Joy of Sports back in about 1974 or five, I don't remember. I know it came out in 76. Now what persuaded me, um, I was coming back from work on the Long Island subway, Long Island train, uh, from Manhattan, hour and a half voyage each way. How can one do that? But anyway, they were, well, how we did it is they served uh, little plastic glasses of scotch <laughs> <laughs> at the back of the train. Um, and I was uh, swirling the scotch in my cup, and I remembered it's Monday night, Monday night baseball. And the Dodgers are on. 
And they're playing Cincinnati series of the season. They're one game behind. And um, now my wife is not a believer. I mean, she just didn't get sports, you know. <laughs> I prayed for her. I fasted. I, I did. I did everything I could, but she just didn't see. And so I found myself going up to bed on my own birthday and watching the uh, Dodgers. And um, it was a good game, and they were in it, and then they lost at the end. Now, I was 40 years old, and I was depressed. I was really, now I didn't even know who the Dodgers were by this point. When I grew up, they were in Brooklyn, and I lived in Pennsylvania. We had a farm club for the Dodgers, so I loved them ever since I was a little boy. I didn't know what Dodgers meant. I didn't know how they got the name, but I loved them, every one. And um, so I'm depressed. And I said, Michael, you're 40 years old. You're not a kid. You don't even know the names of these players. How can you possibly be depressed? But the thought kept nagging me, but the truth is I am. When the Dodgers lose, something's not right with the world. <laughs> and uh, when the Dodgers win, it's heaven. Uh, it's the way that it should be. And um, well, Notre Dame had a coach a few years back. They started out the season saying he was teaching the guys that it's just a game. Already I knew he was a loser. <laughs> uh, it is not a game. It just, it's too important for a game. And uh, I saw the, uh, I became a good friend of Jack Kemp and he used to invite me because of his Super Bowl rings to the Super Bowl every year, as long as I gave a talk on sports to his fundraisers. So I did. And um, I remember one of the first of those games, it was the Dallas Cowboys, and I'm pretty sure the Pittsburgh Steelers. I'm not positive. But I know it was Dallas. And they had a habit of losing in the Super Bowl. They'd clean up the league and the playoffs, and then they'd lose in the final game. I think three times it happened. And this time they were winning, and then Pittsburgh scored twice. And uh, you could see, in, on the, you know, really at the last minute, and you could see the joyous expectation of the uh, Cowboys on the bench when they were winning, rooting and cheering and up on the sidelines. And when Pittsburgh scored, their faces just fell. And it was like they were tasting ash. And it was like they died. And that's true. That's what happens. This is my experience. I cannot stand to lose. I mean, I do my best to be a good loser, but uh, I don't like it. And um, the whole thing is, the whole thing is, whatever the odds, to play so well or so cleverly, do you somehow pull it out? And when you don't do that, the gods are not smiling on you. The wind is not at your back, and it's not a nice feeling. And there are other days when you can't do anything wrong. And it's not exactly your fault, it's, you're just hot. I remember once I was shooting baskets on a court, and um, there was a little kid watching me, a 10-year-old at the side. And I must have shot 17 or 18 from just outside the foul line swish 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 and he said mister could you teach me to do that i said sure kid <laughs> and i started saying you know first you do this and you, i like to dribble first and then jump up a little bit and like this nothing would go in and i kept bouncing off and i said kid will you go back there and sit down <laughs> I mean, you have it or you don't have it, and you don't exactly control it. It's one reason why military people and athletes, and it's true also of business people, are the most religious of the 50 top elites in the country. They all experience often that things are not entirely in their control. 
Everything has to break the right way. And if it doesn't, it's really hard to put it together. And when everything drops, it's just a wonderful, wonderful feeling. Well, anyway. Um, now, another writer helped me to grasp a further point. Vivid experiences in sports illuminate basic concepts of the liberal arts, such as agon, an awareness of unity of purpose in a combat or athletic contest. And few, few men in my youth, and now a good thing women can also experience it, but that came in my lifetime. The contest, the struggle, the agony of trying to win, and the absolutely crucial importance of every person on your team doing the same thing. The crucial purpose, of importance of teamwork and picking up for one another. You know your body at guard has a bum knee, and you know you got to pick up for him. And nobody gives you orders, you just do it. And that adaptation in the game, second by second, to how somebody else needs help, is one of, another of the great joys of life. Um, well, anyway, there was an immigrant scholar from Switzerland who was, came to the United States during World War II, out of flight from the Nazis. His name was Eugen Rosenstock Hussey. He tried for some years to find concrete examples. He was a teacher of the liberal arts. And he tried to find concrete examples of life in the, among American undergraduates for main points about the liberal arts that he didn't have to struggle to explain in Europe because people saw them in statues and monuments and heard stories all their life about them. But he did notice that something similar was available to young Americans in sports. And so he tried out a hypothesis, which he tried out over many years. He began to work with his students' familiarity with the rugged sports in which they engaged on campus. Crew, baseball, football, rugby, track and field, basketball. He called the attention of students to the heroic acts they strove for every day in sports, trying to make an impossible play, an impossible catch, a desperately needed hit, whatever, under pressure, and trying to do it just exactly. Well, you try, and sometimes it works. Sometimes the gods bless you. So he just called attention to the, and I've taught a class in sports as a liberal art, and I love the part where I start asking students, tell me your most vivid memory in sports. What's the point of peak joy in sports? They all have them, the guys, the girls, and they're lovely little stories. But they remember them, for, they will never forget them the peak experiences of life. So, um, Rosen Stokusi pointed out these heroic acts of every day, or got the students to point them out. Their favorite moment in sports. Failure or success. Um, by the way, one of the great things about sports is how many times you fail. I mean, the best baseball team of all time lost one-third of its games in a season. And for years, I thought that's one great advantage males had over females, that you had endured public failure so often. And boy, did guys rag you about it. Guys are tough on each other. Uh, I, I can remember a friend of mine hitting a home run, and when he comes back to the bench, his best friend says, you got to lay off those high fastballs. That's the way guys are, and I really like it. Now, when my daughters played um, field hockey or whatever else they played, they were so supportive of one another. I had to 
choke back my rage. <laughs> <laughs> this is not for fun, kids. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Um, so then he would use in class, he would pick out concepts from Homer, uh, from Aristotle, from the other ancients to open up these experiences, these sports experiences, to deeper understanding. Virtue, virtue is commonly celebrated in the liberal arts, in, in Homer, in the Iliad, in the Odyssey, such as the ability to endure pain, persistence in defeat, the use of quick wit in gaining advantage over foes, the commitment of every member of the team to one another, and their sheer determination to prevail. They're just not going to lose. All these have, been, have frequently been experienced by athletes. American sports and the liberal arts would make a truly illuminating university course. And I've done it. I did it mostly to spite the professors who <laughs> looked down on the athletes. And uh, anyway. Um, many passages of Homer and Virgil evoke experiences already famil familiar to young American athletes in their sports. This is how Joe Paterno, a professor of classics, taught football as what his players most cited later is what they learned about life. It came right out of the Greeks and the Romans. Um, and I'm grateful that all his victories have been restored to him. And in fact, the NCAA, which was so cruel to him and unjust and unfair, finally published its rules on the ideal way of handling cases like he ran into. And they stated exactly what Joe did. I mean, it's just, it's just one of those wonderful turns of justice that, alas, takes so long, and he lost his life uh, in the misery of it. Anyway, the modern mind tends to be organized around the two realities of power. Knowledge is power. And work. Don't just stand there. Do something. Both restlessly pursued in the good name of progress. This focus of mind is the lens through which many journalists and social scientists nowadays perceive sports. Compared with their serious colleagues on the news, science, and business pages, many sports journalists seem vaguely ashamed of reporting on kid stuff. What are sports doing to change the world? When such journalists look at sports, Nowadays, they are visibly preoccupied with its financial side, its excesses, its psychology, social significance, and personal scandals. For instance, in the eighth edition of D. Stanley Eitzen's Sport in Contemporary Society, parts two, three, four, two, three, and four focus on socialization among youth in the mass media and in the widespread use of Native American names and mascots. Parts five to nine address problems of excess, such as overzealous parents like me, um, sexual assaults, drugs, and big time college sports. Parts 10 to 12 address structured inequality in relation to race and ethnicity, gender and sexuality, and the final part 13 includes three articles on globalization. I mean, the whole bloody book is problems, shortcomings, excesses. Not a word on the games it's themselves. The highly concentrated, highly prepared play, the preparation, the game plan, the narrative, the narrative above all. Have you ever missed a game on television or something and you go to look it up in the newspapers the next day, you have the darnest time finding an account of the story. What were the great breakthrough plays? 
they drop that nowadays. They drop the heroic stuff. And they give you sociology. I don't have anything against sociology, but not one I want to know about the game. In actual practice, though, there is joy for the players. There's joy for the spectators. But that joy is experienced only through the actual working out of the narrative of the game. It's moments of suspense. It's heroic acts. It's turning points. It's unforgettable plays. In older days, accounts of sports, even in daily newspapers, used to dwell on these dramatic questions. The sports pages were really fun. They were works of art. Some of the language could be chiseled in marble. I, I, in the sport book, Joy of Sports, I, I quote the entire text of Vince Scully's ninth inning bright, of the ninth inning per perfect game of Sandy Koufax. It's only about this high on the page. There is not one wasted word, not an extra breath, just the essence of what Sandy did. Understated, it is just brilliant. Just a perfect piece of art. And it used to be like that. The game came alive to you, the, the narrative. I, I miss it. All of Eitzen's topics are worthy subjects and they're well researched and well argued. They teach us much that is interesting. Still they are far afield from the central issue. They could as well be found in other sections of a newspaper such as business, society, or the television pages. They do little to probe into sports for what they are. If sports, games played and presented just for the joy of it and the work of it and the sweat of it and the suffering of it and how you overcame obstacles in it. In actual practice, there is joy for the players. There's joy for the spectators. Well, I've said that, so. Worse, one often hears sports broadcasters, this I hate most, speak of their games as entertainment. In fact, sports games are much more than entertainment. A business traveler will find that most nights of the week, patrons around the bar at his hotel or motel don't pay much attention to the television set, fills as it is with entertainment. But when Monday night football is on the set, a newcomer does well to stand in respectful silence until a break in the action. Since most of the spectators are absorbed by the drama in the arena and resist being interrupted, they are in a frame of mind more inward and contemplative than extroverted in this world and just looking for distraction. At a college football game, while the game is in play, intense fans move as little as possible. Game time is a bit like the high holy moments when respectful silence and concentration are in order. Entertainment is what happens at halftime when the bands come marching out and the singers perform and most of the fans run to the bathroom or purchase more hot dogs and beers. It's entertainment, but not the game. The game itself is not entertainment. Its power goes far beyond diversion. Sometimes the game so absorbs us that at the end we feel exhausted as if we have played ourselves. I, I remember on the night we were engaged, I was such a happy fellow. I said, we got to celebrate. So I called the Boston Arena and because uh, the last appearance of the Lakers in Boston with the Celtics was on and um, it was a tie again, and Bob Cousy was playing, so this would be Bob Cousy's last night in Boston for the playoff, for a playoff game. And I called, and the guy laughed at me, he wanted a ticket, so he, then he said, well, he said, we do have one behind a pillar. And he said, you can see one side of the court, but you can't see the other. I said, I'll take it. <laughs> and we went, but Karen almost ended our engagement right there. <laughs> Because I got so intense in the game and was, you know, up on my feet and sweaty and worried about every play, every call. And uh, she's an artist. What she fell in love with was uh, Bob Cousy's skill and his art and his talent. He would fake guys right out of their socks. I mean, 
He'd start one way and they'd be looking at the ball shoot over that way. Easy basket. And um, it was just beautiful to watch. Um, anyway. So coming out of a really great game, football game, let's say, is like coming out of another and better world, especially if you win. Um, now suddenly return to the profane, prosaic, unbeautiful world of finding one's own automobile. <laughs> what a jar, what a come down. Um, on the other hand, if it's Philadelphia and the Redskins and the, the Redskins win, it's an unpleasant experience exiting the stadium. Uh, Philadelphia doesn't like to lose. They lose ugly. And uh, you better stay out of the way. But anyway, okay. So it's not just entertainment. It really isn't. Okay, it's in the moments when we are caught up in playing or in participant viewing, which is very different from spectating, that we come closest to experience, to experiencing human existence outside of time. At a sports event, quoting again, there may be spectators, just as some people come to church to hear the music. But a participant is not a spectator merely, even if he does not walk among the clergy. At a liturgy, elected representatives perform the formal acts, but all believers put their hearts into the ritual. It is considered inadequate almost blasphemous to be a mere spectator. Fans are not mere spectators. If they wanted no more than to pass the time to find diversion, there are cheaper and less internally exhausting ways to get there. Sports are rituals concerning human survival on this planet. It's life and death on the field, if you take the game on its own terms. And when you lose, you feel like you died. And when you win, if you just can't do anything wrong, fortuna is in your sails. Why are all the sports teams made in, in, in ovals? <coughs> to celebrate the goddess Fortuna. Football is designed around the breaks. I mean, the ball was deliberately made not round to bounce in angles that you can't control. Uh, it's built around fortune. And I have a friend who was worried about all the wear and tear on pro basketball players in 120 games or however many they play. And he suggested that what they ought to do is only play one minute um, and uh, settle it right there, <laughs> save all the wear and tear, <laughs> which is usually the best part of the game anyway. And uh, OK. Um, it has shocked some that in my earlier writings I speak of certain sports events as liturgies. The dictionary de de definition of liturgy is a rite or body of rites prescribed for public worship. Rite is defined, rite, R-I-T-E, is defined as a set form for conducting a ceremony and a ceremonial act or action. Just so, a participant knows exactly what forms to expect as a football, baseball or basketball ceremony is about to get underway. And in the United States, at least, the ceremonies that are great sports liturgies are very often consecrated by a prayer to the divine, or when not, by acts of piety and reverence toward the nation and the history, the much blessed history of a blessed nation. Observing these with some amazement, G. K. Chesterton, the British writer, once described America as a nation with the soul of a church. And even when he observed an inauguration of a president, it opened with a prayer and closed with the refrain, except in one, one occasion, one election, closed with the refrain, God bless America. And he said, you couldn't do that in Britain. Couldn't do it in France. But in America, politics, sports, it always begins with the Almighty, um, nation with the soul of a church. Um, now, our three sports, the Holy Trinity, 
are each based around a different mythical structure, a different narrative structure. I'm not going to linger on this, but just let me mention. Football, essentially, is a narrative of the will to run for daylight through 11 hulking monsters intent on obstructing that will. It's a narrative of overcoming obstacles by sheer spunk and wit. Baseball, by contrast, is a Lockean narrative of liberty and law. The voice of the umpire rules on every play, the law, strike, ball, in, out. Uh, and um, it's not only law and liberty, it's a very freewheeling game, uh, but it's also ordered, symmetrical, calming, and it's designed to test whether those who run will be brought home. It's like the Yankee clipper ships going out around the world. The point of the game is to come home. And it's what it is in baseball. It's where the runs are. Um, basketball is a narrative of human shiftiness, faint, deception, and laser-like passing designed to penetrate a tall, active, and intensely alert defensive five. It's hard to imagine how much poorer the United States would be, culturally poor, morally pure, poor, aesthetically poor, and contemplatively poor, if it wholly lacked these three great ceremonial actions, these teachers both of personal courage and communal intensity. Because it's the whole team and it's the whole crowd experiencing it together that's, again, half the fun adds a huge dimension to the play. For human beings, the most important thing is the realm of ends and of being and beauty and truth. This depth we come closest to in play. It is so in the interior life, in prayer. It is also so in the experience of the great highlights and intuitions of eternity, the heroic and the more than human that even young boys and girls begin first to know in sports. I know of nothing that has taught my, two, my son and two daughters and their children so much about the depths of life than their experiences of courage, teamwork, defeat, victory, and pain in the sports they loved in school, each different. To go in a matter of weeks, six weeks, from being the Littlest kid on the team whose inexcusable misplay. I hurried home from work one day to get to see my son play Little League. He was about seven. And he was always the tenth man chosen, so he was out in right field. And um, they were winning. Last out, a guy hits a fly ball out toward right field. My son is very excited, makes one mistake. He runs in, and the ball runs out. <laughs> now, I'm crossing the field thinking, how am I going to console him? What do I, I, I said, you know, you have degrees in both philosophy and theology. You should have something to say. <laughs> and when I got there and I started to say something, I have no idea what. But I got there, and my son said, Dad, don't say a word. <laughs> I lost a game, that's it. And so he went, he was really dejected, lost for the whole team, for the whole season. And then in basketball season, he comes up uh, with the final shot and wins the game in, in overtime. Now, what could I do or how could I teach him to live through those two experiences in an order just of weeks? Failure? in which he knew he blew it. He was responsible, no excuses. And then, you know, as small as he was on the team, taking the final shot and dropping it. Well, how could you teach? Uh, what, what could I do to teach a son something like that? And the growth that occurred between those things. And the way he knows that a lot of his fortuna, I mean, a lot of it is 
you made the wrong play. You ran the wrong way. And the other one, you shot and luckily you were hot. You got it. You know you missed a lot of them in practice. Okay. Um, so, um, sports do not teach us every lesson in, about life. For guys, they don't teach us much about women. Um, and that turns out to be an important part of life. Um, but what they do lead us to is invaluable. Every profession can, after a time, grow stale. So let me conclude on a cautionary note. Quoting again, sports are not, of course, all of life. What good are courage, honesty, freedom, community, and excellence if they do not inform one's family, family life, civic life, political life, and work life? Sports are not everything. But they do not celebrate such qualities in order to contain them, but in order to hold them clearly before the aspiring heart. No one can live a life wholly within sports. For professional athletes, sports themselves may become work, not sports. Just as for the professional academic, studies may become work, not liberal arts. Just as for a professional clergyman, Religion may become work, not spirit. So I conclude on this note. Play on. Live intensely. Taste eternity. Work, work, work. But in the end, in order to exalt. You work in order to play. You don't play in order to work. Um, to paraphrase St. Irenaeus in the second century, the glory of God is the athlete fully alive. Thanks very much. We now have time for a few questions. Please stand when the microphone comes to you. What do you mean a few questions? My record top period for a uh, question period is nine hours. So. <laughs> yeah, it is the political season now, and a big issue is inequality. Bernie makes a big issue out of that. Businessmen that make greedy businessmen making millions of dollars. But it seems that sports people making millions of dollars are excluded from this. An explanation? Businessmen are evil when they make millions. Sportsmen are heroes when they make millions. And they are. I agree. Well, I think it's the achievement of the thing. It takes so much work and so much practice and so much discipline and so much love of one fellows. Uh, I remember student women athletes at Ave Maria while I was teaching. They talked about what it was like to be on their basketball team and how they'd never before experienced such an intensity depending on one another. And they'd break their knees for one another, whatever it took. It's, it's such a beautiful human event, glory, when you play at the top of your form that you remember it for all time and people who see it remember it. I mean, I'm sure you've seen baseball plays that you've never forgotten. You might have been 11 years old. And um, Al John Frito's catch against the right field wall. And um, so on. They, they just live in glory. Well, you see, you have me here, because I do think that the same is true in business. And I, I don't understand. I used to be a left of left. And one thing that made me more conservative about it is I couldn't understand how people of the political party I then belonged to kept talking about jobs, 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 but they hated employers. 
No, that just doesn't work. I mean, you c You can't have employees without employers. So one of the greatest acts of social justice in the world, I think it's the one we need most in the world in which we live, uh, are people who can create small businesses. Latin America needs about 20 million of them employing between 10 and 15 persons each, or even fewer, but you get the idea. And um, Africa, more. But there's enormous unemployment and underemployment in both those continents. But what doesn't make sense is an awful lot to do on those continents. There's a tremendous number of things to be done, and there are a tremendous number of men and women who have, are not doing them. Well, how does that happen? What happens to the entrepreneur who comes with the spark? to inspire and direct people to create and do the jobs that need to be done, and, end up, and along with that, create an income. Now you can't, in the United States, the inequality figures, there is inequality of income. But gosh, look at the figures for the people who work and don't work. The number of people who don't work at all is in the millions. Well, there's no way they're going to have in equal income, especially since when they get handouts from the government, it doesn't count. The government doesn't count those in its uh, poverty figures. Um, so I'm with James Madison and with Leo the Thirteenth, Pope Leo the Thirteenth both of whom said in their slightly different ways, the pursuit of equality is a wicked project. It's inhuman. Look in your own family, if you have five, six, or around Ave Maria, we usually have seven or eight kids. <laughs> they're all different. And even if they're highly talented, they're differently motivated. And, um, you can't, you couldn't enforce one regime on all the kids. You, you just couldn't do it if you tried. So Leo the Thirteenth has a passage in which he says that uh, the pursuit of equality is futile. Uh, it's mistaken, wrong in its conception, and it's evil. And a good society needs lots of variety of people. Uh, not everybody can do the same jobs. And it would drive me crazy to have to be in a toll booth collecting tickets all day. But there are people who are glad for the job. And it's controlled hours and it takes all kinds of people is the point. So why would you want to make everybody equal? It doesn't make any sense. and It can't be done anyway. So there's a, there's a mythical pursuit of equality in the modern world, which is the root of socialism and communism and state, statism. Um, and it doesn't make any sense. And anybody using common sense can see it doesn't make any sense. Anyway, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to go off on that. Yeah, I did. <laughs> Mr. Novak, uh, most of the younger people here obviously are part of the, I'll call it the sports center generation where you're watching highlights and seeing things on TV in a 24-7 news cycle. Uh, would you encourage them to go back and read some of the great sports writers like Red Smith and Jim Murray and Dave Anderson, maybe Bob Ryan from the Boston Globe, Grantland people like Rice. that? Excuse me? Grantland Rice. Grantland Rice, of course. Yeah. Uh, just, just to get a flavor that Good writing is good writing regardless of the subject. It's, it's gone for most sports reporting because they've lost the story. They've lost the narrative. And it's the narrative, the mythic struggle that has all the hidden power of it. And um, it's, it's tragic that that happened. It doesn't need to happen. Kids like the games anyway. They, they see it. They know the reality. By the way, the guy who invented basketball, the third part of the Trinity, 
uh, was a Protestant minister. And his do job was preparing missionaries. So uh, crucial to them was building up the health and stamina. This is pretty early on. And, um, and uh, but what could you do as in Massachusetts? What could you do in December or January? Coming up here from Florida, I ask myself. <laughs> <laughs> But he, so he, he decided they needed to play sports, so he used the gym, but he discovered the guys don't really like to just do exercises and calisthenics and so forth. So he decided to invent a game that they could play indoors, then to fill their minds and hearts. And he was Protestant, so he, he, it had to be goal-oriented. So his first question was, where is he going to put the goals? And the question was, is he put them on, this, on, the, you know, on the wall? Then he said, no, they'll hurt each other too much throwing the ball at that. So he put them up 10 feet high. And you had to throw, to score, you had to throw a gentle arc of grace. You know. And in um, uh, the game, I moved on. I'm teasing, of course, but there's, uh, there's some truth in it. Um, so yeah, but it's a different mythos from football or baseball. If you set it to music, it would be a whole different kind of music, you know, for football you need a pretty big symphony or concert. For baseball you can do it with, um, what do they, what's the word I want for it? I can't think, a quartet or quintet, you know, or just a piano. Um, just nice, going with the green grass and the, you know, they say Americans are activists, we're always too busy. They haven't watched baseball. <laughs> I mean, you know, nothing happens for, 15 minutes at a time. But it's very American. That's rural America. That's where it grew up. And uh, my wife is from Iowa, and uh, I used to love to sit on the back porch in the mornings and listen to the grass grow. I mean, <laughs> it'd be cut early in the morning, and by noon it'd be an inch high already, you know. Uh, anyway, it almost crackled. It grew so much. But, um, Basketball it has to be jazz. You know, everybody plays to a different melody, and you just get it to come together every so often. Every instrument is improvising. Every player is improvising. It's it's just a a very different sport, um, and, and it's living out a different mythos. It's teaching a different ethic. And these three, uh, the reason I like to pay attention to them, all three were invented by Americans. It was said, I think by Tocqueville even, that in America there are no games. Americans don't play games. Well, that was before the 1860s and after Doubleday. And then football, Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And um, then, as I said, basketball 30 or 40 years later. These are games invented by Americans, for Americans. Nobody played them for years. By the way, I learned an interesting thing from the Koreans. Um, I was giving lectures on economics and democracy. and One of them stood up and said, look, we noticed we hate the Japanese. So we're always competing with them. And he said, we, we noticed that the Japanese didn't take off, development didn't occur, till they brought in baseball. And he said, the reason why is in Japan, as in China, there was no place for the individual. You did things in great groups. Massive amounts of people would clear a, Air, air base, um, and so on. And um, 
In baseball, you had to go to the plate one at a time. Nobody could go there for you. And the taunt was choke. Can you do it? Uh, and then on the other hand, it's a game of teamwork. You know, a team is only as good as its ninth member. And, uh, and also, you, you learn it by law. Everything in baseball happens by law. So you learn liberty and law, individual and team. Um, I didn't get a third one, I can't remember. He said, we started to play baseball. And that's when we took off. Um, I think there's a lot of merit in that argument. You need a certain set of habits in order to bring about development in democracy and in, by capitalism I mean the economy based on invention and discovery. You know, look around this room, this plastic bottle of water, this microphone, the cloth, the chairs you're sitting in, the rugs, none of these existed at the time of the founders. They've all been invented in the last 200 and some years. And what made that possible, Lincoln pointed out, is the Patent and Copyright Act, which he said is the sixth greatest step in the history of liberty. For the first time, it changed the meaning of wealth, which used to mean land, the great landowners, full of inequality, and made the main source of ideas, source of wealth ideas. And the poorest guy could have the invention that made him fabulously wealthy. Um, and it changed the, the whole drama of economic life from a land-owning society to an inventive society. And um, anyway, so sorry, I didn't mean to go off that way, but. We have time for one more question. Uh, you touched on how uh, sport leads us to beauty and truth, and then you mentioned uh, how sports can shape our lives with failure and success and the growth in between. And with uh, our education system for like elementary school and middle schools falling, many parts of the United States, obesity on the rise in young children, it seems like sports would play an important part in a child's development, yet more and more uh, schools are cutting out uh, recess time in sports, uh, in exchange for other programs. Would you say that uh, sports should be a required part of a child's education? Well, I don't want to condemn it to death, but, uh, but there's something very silly going on in our society. Parents are so afraid of their children getting hurt. Um, there's just almost no free time. Gosh. My parents used to let us go out hiking in the hills and so forth. And whatever adventures we came upon, they wouldn't all be pretty. We'd be better for it. No supervised play. And to play baseball, we know how to pick up teams. And um, we know how to set up bases and with a rock or something, pillow, or not a pillow, but a pad or something. And, we would just do it, and it was really rough. And we didn't know the rules for soccer. That wasn't one of the American games. And we just called it Sock Him. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we weren't quite as tough as the Canadians. I mean, my, my buddies in Canada, they described the, the uh, what do you call it, the thing over the fireplace, the, the mantle. mantle, that's the word I want. I'm 82 years old. I have the same photographic memory I had at 25, but I don't have any film. And I, <laughs> I just can't get it. I know it's there, but I, I can't get it. Okay. So a mantle with little jars of formaldehyde with every one of the stitches they've had. And the guy with the most stitches is the most proud. And mom's proud of him. You know, and uh, okay. Um, so... But look, isn't it true that on campus, the place that doesn't get or need affirmative action is sports, where it's merit and pure merit, more, you know, maybe not pure, but merit, 
more than any other place in, in, on the campus. And uh, <clears throat> Senator Hayakawa, the Japanese senator from Hawaii, said it wasn't fair. He said uh, there should be an affirmative action unit for Japanese and pro basketball. <laughs> uh, uh, but anyway, you know, it's just, it's just not that way. And where quality counts and excellence counts and perfection counts and are cherished. Um, that, that's a great gift of athletics to American life. And okay. Uh, Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. <laughs>